Um, we're just so excited to have you. Just giving people a few more seconds to, to join us. Welcome. Good to see so many people joining. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it's it like, a lot. It's gonna be- It's like counting votes. <laughs> not supposed to say that we're focusing on pros and not politics today <laughs> cover that part <laughs> <laughs> yeah. welcome welcome thank you all for joining us it's going to be an awesome discussion today so excited Give people a few more seconds wait for the count to stabilize Thanks okay, for you're right, Elizabeth. This is the <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, funny. Yes, this is going to be an awesome event. Sheree and Elizabeth are going to talk about planes, I assume. It's going to be great. Yes. All righty. And I am so glad that you are all here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to PMP Live. My name is Ellie, and I'm a bookseller in the Children and Teens Department at Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this format, where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I am thrilled to work welcome our guests this evening, Elizabeth Ween and Cherie L. Smith. You can click the link we will drop in the chat to get your own copy of their books. And we have signed book plates for the Enigma game, While Supplies Last. Something good to know. If you have a question for our guests, guests, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. At the end of the chat, our guests will have time to answer some of your questions. You can also vote on questions you like and want answered. As always, please remember that this is a creative safe space and we ask that folks be respectful of one another in the questions and comments. Now on to the event you're waiting for. Elizabeth Ween is the award-winning author of 13 books for young adults, including Codename Verity, Rose Under Fire, and A Thousand Sisters. She has lived in England, Jamaica, the U.S., and Scotland. She has her pilot's license and has flown great distances in several countries. She lives in Scotland, where she and her husband raised their two grown children. Cherie L. Smith is the award-winning author of eight middle grade and young adult novels, including Fly Girl and the new Blossom and the Firefly. In 2014, she was a National Book Awards judge in the Young People's Literature category. She has worked in animation, comic books, construction, and film, including in a monster factory, where she managed the people making monsters and dead people for movies and TV. She lives in Los Angeles with the love of her life and a distributable cat. And now I'll turn it over to them. Thank you so much for Thank you, Ellie. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Sheree. <laughs> welcome, we're, we're, welcome. We're so far away from each other. <laughs> How we are. We're like, like uh, I don't know, 6,000, 8, 7,000, about yeah, 7,000 7, miles away. Miles, yeah. And yet close in our hearts. That's right. <laughs> and in our choice of topic for writing. <laughs> That's right. We, so, we, World War II. World War II and planes. And planes. So, specifically, yeah. World War II aviation. Um, so you were here today with the Enigma game, which came out yesterday. Um, yep. uh, uh, congratulations. Thank um, you. I've had a chance to devour this book and, and uh, devour is the right word for it. Um, if you uh, pick up your copy today and you, you're in for a treat, um, you know, if you wouldn't mind starting with just explaining to the folks at home what the Enigma game is about. Um, I think that'd be a good place. To start. Yeah, it's it's something that I wish I would get better at doing every time I do it. <laughs> the dreaded <laughs> elevator pitch. Elevator pitch for this book is just I haven't perfected it. Um, it is it's really about three different people, well, three different young people and an old woman who come together on uh, Royal Air Force Base in Scotland in 1940. So it's near the beginning of the war, and it's kind of after the Battle of Britain, but while the Blitz is going on and the local squadron is flying out to defend North Sea shipping. And the three young people are Jamie, who is part of the squadron, and Ellen, who is a driver for the Royal Air Force Squadron um, and is uh, of a Scottish traveler origin. And the third character, and they, they take turns narrating this, is Louisa, who is half Jamaican and half English. And both her parents have recently been killed in 
by enemy action. And she has had to find a job. And the job she's found is looking after this old woman who is living in the pub. And the woman turns out to be a German refugee. And things get started when a German pilot who is working for the resistance flies into this airfield. Many things have gone wrong, so he's missed his connections. And he hides an Enigma machine in the pub where Louisa and her charge are staying. And they find the machine and this bizarre group of people come together to use it to help the Air Force squadron figure out where the submarines are gonna be and avoid getting caught by enemy fire. And they're not really supposed to be doing it. And the Germans figure out what's going on. So Don't they come under fire. Stop. All right, Lord. sorry, spoilers, It's a tough one. It's a tough one. It's a tough so one. Do you know going it's tough? On. Part of the reason it's tough is because there's so many people involved in it. Which must and have been a real it's like trying to explain all the different, like, you know, machinations. Yeah. But there's Enigma machine, there's planes, and there's intrigue. And there's, and there's characters. For, and there's characters. <laughs> no, <laughs> but like the characters, the characters are, the, are, are kind of, you know, what, what makes it work. They're, the they're, characters are the heart of the story, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And they each have their own sort of little journey to self, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so to just to explain for those of you who don't know what an Enigma machine is. Good this, point, Sherry. Want to explain or do you want, I mean, from my, my understanding of it is it, it was a, a coding machine yes. used by the Germans to send, uh, you know, encoded messages, uh, secret messages. So now yeah. you've got this group of basically unqualified people um, right. coming together to break German code and figure right. out what's going on. And the, the importance of the Enigma machine is really, um, and you may know this from, uh, I can't remember what the movie was called. I think but it might it, called Enigma. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's what Alan Turing was famous for working on and the computer people at Bletchley Park were famous for working on was trying to crack this code. It was the way the germ, it was the machine that the Germans used to send all their messages to each other. And you know, there were thousands of these machines and each squadron had different codes that they used. And the issue was not so much that the machine was a secret, but that the different ways of setting the codes up were secret and they changed every day. And the allies never knew how they were gonna use them. And there were literally millions of different ways that, yeah. that the combinations could work. So Everybody getting, yeah, and, and actually that was something that I didn't know when I wrote the book. And I had to kind of go back and, and rethink what I was doing because my characters needed to have like the codes for setting the coding machine as well as having a coding machine itself. Right, it's complicated. It is complicated. It's complicated. And yet you read the book and it's not complicated at all. It's Thank just you. exciting. Because I was gonna say, I'm sure this is something that you can relate to. You don't wanna, you don't wanna um, make your readers have to work out that code themselves. Right. It's, you know, because it, it, it's, it's mind boggling and you don't want them, you don't wanna put people off, you know, with this going into how it's actually constructed. Right. Well, no, the British needed a giant uh, machine, a giant computer <laughs> to crack, to <laughs> figure it out. So like me sitting there with my bookmark and like, right. you know, <laughs> no, this is, it's very absorbable. It's very absorbable and, and, and absorbing, I should say. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I should ask you, I wanted to ask you about like what attracts you to writing World War II stories. And then if you could narrow it down to specifically this one, um, right. because you are known for um, several World War II stories, aviation, spies, this sort of, you know, brings that winning combination back together again. Whenever, whenever I go back into my distant past, it always, it, it always sounds kind of cheesy. Cause like, you know, first of all, first of all, I sat, I sat in my homeroom class in, in sixth grade, I sat next to a bookshelf that had a little um, collection of World War II stories on it fiction stuff. And I, and I would sit there in homeroom and kind of just reach over and pull one of these books out and read it. And 
go, wow, these people were amazing. So, and I was really into like stories of resistance and stories of the Holocaust, stories of civilians, you know, stories that took place on the home front, um, people who were in the Blitz. So never the military side of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And when I was in high school, my friend, I actually, I then went on to make up this like long, complicated, epic story when I was about 12 years old, which involved these people working for the resistance in Denmark and which I knew a lot about. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, from the shelf and homeroom, of course. Right. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yes. And so I had this big melodrama going on in my head and then I, Uh, went to high school and my French teacher who I had for three years, whose name was Annette Berman, turned out to have worked for the French resistance when she was like 18 years old. Um, She was Jewish and she was in hiding um, in a village outside Paris and she was recruited by the resistance. And we used to sit there in French French class and try to get her to tell us stories of, you know, delivering dynamite in her bicycle basket and stuff like that. So she was this amazing woman. And I guess when we knew her, she was probably in her sixties. Um, and it was hard to, you know, imagine her as a teen doing all this exciting stuff. Cause when she rode a bicycle, which she did in the little bike path near our house, she said, if you do not get out of my way and I, I will ring my bell. And if you don't get out of my way, I will fall off. <laughs> just imagining her with her dynamite, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she was fascinating and, and quite a heroic woman. And she was a, a huge inspiration to me. So, you know, there were just kind of things feeding um, me throughout my life. And when I got into flying, which I did because my husband had a pilot's license and we used to go to air shows, I would, I, I kind of, you know, put it all together. Mm-hmm. And I think specifically why I've started writing now, because I have all these Arthurian fantasy books that I wrote, um, you know, for 10 years before I started writing about World War II. I didn't realize I'd written 13 books. (laughs) (laughs) But five of them were, were set in the sixth century. And I think it's because living here, there's so much debris of the war all around me. Um, And the beaches are littered with anti-invasion traps, these concrete blocks that they put up to stop invasion craft from coming up and and, um, anti-aircraft huts, these little concrete concrete defenses that people would sit in to, you know, shoot at people Mm -hmm. who were were trying to come in. And they're all put up in about three months in 1940. And we're trying. talking about Scotland. This is the yeah, coast yeah, of Scotland. Yeah, so, and this, yeah. So this is, this is what, it's all still there. The mobilization and, was massive in World yeah. War II from zero to a hundred in, like you said, yeah. three months. And the staying power of this stuff, the fact that it's still there. And it, that's actually one of the things that's kind of amazing about it is, you know, it was, it was in use. It was, it was put up in this tiny, small amount of time. And it was really just for the invasion, which didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was in, in use for, I don't know, six months and it's It's like planning a wedding. You plan a wedding for a year. It's been sitting there for 80 years. It doesn't go away. Yeah. Well, you know, but that's, you know, so Scotland, Hadrian's wall has been (laughs) there for a thousand years, you know, but it's fascinating. I mean, fascinated with Hadrian's wall too. So there are a lot of bones. There are a lot of bones of the former world lying I see surface. this stuff and I want to kind of populate the landscape. That makes perfect sense. Um, you know, we talked a little bit beforehand. Um, is there a section you'd like to read from oh, the yes. book? Yes, yes, I was going to read a section. Um, and as anybody who's listening is obviously aware, it's a complex book. Uh, so I'll try to give you a little bit of background for what I'm going to read you. This is when the German pilot has come to the pub with his Enigma machine and the people who are all there kind of don't know what he wants. They're all terrified of him. Ellen, the driver has had to bring him there at gunpoint um, so he had she, her at gunpoint. He clarify. had her at gunpoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she hates him and she and she's convinced he's the enemy. Uh, the, this is told by Louisa, but Jane, the old woman that she's looking after, is in the room and 
is a German speaker because she's a German refugee, but she wants to hide that because she doesn't want to be hated by the general populace. And then the other person who's in this scene is Nancy Campbell, who is the landlady. So Jane, the old woman is her aunt, and that's why they're all there. And this is the scene where the German pilot has come in and he's gonna stay there for the night to wait to meet his contact and he wants to drink. Mrs. Campbell refilled his glass with beer and resentment and the German pilot crossed the room to the piano. He took his wooden case with him. The polished blonde box looked like a small gramophone, much like Jane's, but without the loudspeaker. The pilot placed his box on the piano next to Jane's gramophone and laid his gun on top of the box. The two cases looked like a mother and child gramophone sitting side by side. With his hands free, the German opened the piano lid. His left hand pulled out a hesitant arpeggio of low tones from the keyboard. Almost as if he were surprised to find the piano in tune, he coaxed out a few more handfuls of sound repetitive and dark and insistent. Then he added a high sustained trill in the right hand. It was Mendelssohn, the Hebrides overture. His fingers moved like wind over the keys and the music was heartbreaking, heart stopping, filling the damp walls of the old house with beauty and longing and a crashing of waves. It was not a piece I usually think of when I think of mummy. It is an orchestral piece but the last time I heard it, Mummy was playing it on the school piano. I don't remember crossing the room. I stood next to him at the piano, tears streaming down my face and watched his hands, long bony, strong fingers and a plain gold ring with a bear engraved on it, flying over the keys. The German pilot suddenly realized I was there beside him. He broke off playing to snatch up his pistol so I couldn't grab it myself. The music stopped abruptly, and as he grabbed at the gun, he knocked it against his wooden case. The front of the box was a narrow hinged flap held in place by a hasp on the flat lid, and when the gun hit the catch, it must have been loose, the front flap fell open to lay bare a panel full of holes and wires, each labeled with numbers and the letters of the alphabet like a telephone switchboard. The inside of the wooden flap was stamped with a brand name, Enigma. The German pilot flipped the front flap back up. He had to raise the lid on top of the case a little bit to fit the catch back into place. And beneath the lid, I saw a keyboard of ordinary typewriter keys. It looked like a portable electrical typewriter he used the gun to make me step back. Jane spoke suddenly, sharp and scolding in a language I didn't understand, but the pilot did. He put the gun back into his coat pocket and stepped away from me, holding up his empty hands to show he wasn't going to threaten me anymore. I do speak a little German, Jane admitted grudgingly. I know you do, said Mrs. Campbell. So, what happens next is they have a conversation and it's translated and yeah, um, eventually shenanigans ensue. <laughs> but shenanigans. I, I chose that, I, sh I chose that, that section because it's the first time where, I, th I think it's the first time and no, it's not the first time in the book where music is shared, but it's the first time where they use it um, to communicate when they don't actually speak the same language. Which right. happens again, so that's something you know I'd love to talk to you about because so my my latest book The Blossom and the Firefly is set in World War II Japan and it is a teenage kamikaze pilot and a junior high school girl who um, is serving as a maid for the pilots um, before they leave on their final flights and the language that they share in common they actually do share the same language they're both Japanese but the connection they have is yeah. through music music is something she loves and he is a violinist and in another world he'd be a violinist and not a suicide pilot yeah. um and that is the it's a piece of music at first that brings them together it's Mozart for me and it's Mendelssohn for you yeah and I'm curious um I know I came about that because I think for me music is and I'm not a musician but I think music is the purest 
expression of emotion because um, it's direct, it skips language and it just tugs at you in a certain way. And there seemed to be something um, poignant about it um, in times of war. Um, I studied German in high school, actually, French and German. And there was this song that we would sing that was um, heaven and earth will all fade away, but music will remain. Yeah. And so I wonder what made you mo- use music um, as this point of connection? It started because, well, I wanted, uh, what I started the book with was the, the old woman and the young girl. I wanted to have this connection between, between um, a young person and an old person. And I also had wanted to, you know, sort of set it on an airfield and bringing music into it was a very obvious connection for me because I'm among other things, a fan of Lucy Boston who wrote the Green No books, um, which are kind of old fashioned there, but of the, the middle of the last century. Um, I think her most famous one is The Children of Green No, but she was an English writer and she has a, an autobiography, which is called Memory in a House. And in that book, she talks about, she lived in the oldest inhabited house in England. And she talks about how during the war, they would, she was living very close to an airfield and she would hear the bombers going off to, on their missions to Germany. And they would count them as they came back and, and, you know, wonder if they'd been okay. And she wondered what she could do to, to do something for these young men who were risking their lives every night. And what she came up with was, I have a house and I have a record player. I have a place that is a refuge. I'm going to give them concerts. And she did. She gave these weekly concerts where the young men from the squadron would all come into her living room and just sit there listening to music. And it's a really, really moving image, this idea of time out of time. And they put the war aside and, you know, only for the hour or so that they're there. Um, And of course they got to know these young men and then some of them wouldn't come back. And I wanted to kind of just, you know, play with that and put that in. And that's, that's where it started from the Mendelssohn in particular, I had kind of as one of my background theme songs while I was watching Codename Verity. So it was an obvious one, but that's partly because Mendelssohn is a German composer and he, the Hebrides overture is, well, was inspired by Scotland. Yeah, and it turns out, of course, I'm not sure I knew this at the time, but I learned it when I was writing the Enigma game. He was also Jewish and so his music was banned in Germany. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that also becomes a theme in the book that th- this, this German pilot is actually playing music that he's not allowed to play or to listen to at home, which Jane, the German woman recognizes so yeah. that he's communicating in more ways than one. He's not just touching other people with music, but he's There's actually, a language behind the music yeah, that's saying, yeah. I am on your side, yeah. I am not Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's fascinating. Like, I, I, I almost hate to call it the weaponization of music, but the <laughs> idea that music is so potent that a government would ban it yeah. playing because of the identity of the, the creator. The, Mozart, it was an argument in Japan during the war. They, they tried yeah. to stop doing Western things, but the violin is a Western instrument. And Mozart was allowed because he was Austrian. Right. And, you know, and that was close to Germany, who was right. an ally, like <laughs> such a weird yeah. but bunch of uh, hoops to yeah. jump through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so clearly even the people in power know that music can be dangerous because it speaks to the heart. Yep, yep, it does. It to the heart. You even have another nod in there of the, um, the, um, the Christmas piece in World War I. Um, oh the yeah, the, 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 what was it? When, what was that called? Well, it was when they all, when they all pl- um, played football together, the, the Christmas trees. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. 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 And, the, yeah. And, they, and they sang Silent Night together. Yeah, this was German soldiers and, yeah. and uh, English soldiers. Um, Stopped fighting in the trenches. Yeah. Ceasefire, yeah. yeah. A Christmas yeah. ceasefire. Yeah. Um, and music brought them together again, you yeah. know? So yeah. that's, that's very powerful. Thank you for that. Um, 
You know, I'm going to ask you one other question about, um, so Louisa in this is, mm. is Black. She is half Black Caribbean and half um, uh, Caucasian British. And um, there's an issue in there of her being like the only person of color <laughs> in this in little Scotland. town right. where she is and how she has this urge to serve um, during the war but there are restrictions, uh, things that she can't overcome. And Jamie um, mentions there's a color, there was a color ban in the military in the UK, much like here in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about that history? I just find it sort of interesting. Yeah. So there was a there was a guy um, who who is kind of the the Martin Luther King of of the UK, and his name was Harold. I think it was Harold Moody. Um, Harold Moody. Yeah. And he had, so he did, a, he was also Jamaican and he was, he and his sisters and brothers were in the early part of the 20th century, the first 10 years of the 20th century, all college educated. He was a doctor and he had a, he was instrumental in, you know, coming up with um, societies for black people in the UK and Caribbean people and trying to, you know, get them more involved in, in life and to get things to be fairer for them. And his son, Joe Moody, joined the Royal Air Force during the war and found that he could not become an officer because he was, although he had been born in the UK, was not of pure European descent. And, and of course, his father was like, right, we're going to fight this. Um, his, his daughter as well was, was enlisted. Um, I'm not sure if she was in the RAF, or, but yeah. she, they, they were both, you know, um, it's fascinating serving for their country. fascism and Fight. this pure Aryan yeah. race. Yeah. And then, I know. then they have their it's own It's just ridiculous. Law. What they ended up doing, because this guy was basically so influential, was that they ended up kind of like bending the rules a little bit um, right at the beginning of the war. As far as I know, really only in the Royal Air Force. Now, there, I don't know a whole lot about the other branches of the military, but I do know because Louise's father is a merchant seaman and I had sort of intended him to be in the Navy. I do know that they wouldn't let Black men in the Navy um, become officers. They would in the area. But no, no they, they just wouldn't oh, let them. They wouldn't them. let them serve. serve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's um, fascinating. When so, it's all hands on deck and then you get paid uh, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. And I mean, and so he, in the book, he serves in the Merchant Navy and, and he's angry about it, but there's nothing else that he can do. Right. And of course, you know, it was necessary that there were people doing this. But I did a lot of background reading on what Caribbean women did. And it, it's different. It, it's different and similar to what went on in the US because there's a different history of how the white population of the mother country, as they call it, relates to the people the within that colonies. country, the people of color within that country, because they are colonials, okay? Yeah. So they don't have quite the same history of slavery. I mean, they didn't have slaves in a huge population, but they had these colonies. And then they had these people who were kind of subservient but I want to. I don't want to say it, it was better. It was just different. It was different. The African slave different. trade ended earlier in the United Kingdom than it did in the United yeah. States. And then even when it ended, um, to, you know, like the importation, the Middle Passage in the United States ended, you were still allowed to sort of, yes. I mean, for lack of a yes. better word, breed enslaved people. Yes. If you were yes. from slaves, yes. then you stayed a slave. And that definitely had changed in the UK. So, but but the, the main also, difference that I'm okay. seeing is that is that people who were from the colonies and had now become kind of middle class, and in fact, the people who who served from the Caribbean um, for the British during World War II were, tended to be middle class. They tended to be very mm -hmm. well educated. Um, so they certainly finished school. They may also have some college behind them. Um, but they thought of Britain as their mother country. Sure. 
And they were British, you know, that that was their citizenship. That's what it said on their passports. So well, there's this happening. complicated relationship. It's interesting because in, so in World War II in the United States, it was a Jim Crow army segregated until 1948, like a full uh, right. 11 years after right. things changed in the UK. And I think what it is interesting is the patriotism that people feel, whether or not their country treats them yeah. like first or second class yeah. citizens. And yeah. we see it today too. There are, oh, you know, we have all kinds of immigrants and minorities at, serving or wanting to serve yep. um, their nation to make it the place they want it to be. Yep. Yep. And I think that is something that sort of inspired me in uh, the Enigma game is Louisa has every reason to feel like an outsider, but she finds her misfit family here and they're all working for the betterment of and, their- And one of the, when I was working on this book, I got a, a note, a piece of fan mail from somebody in Australia who said, oh, I really loved Codename Verity. If you ever decide to write a book about a bomber squadron, don't forget the Australians. <laughs> and, and, right. <laughs> and actually that was kind of one of the things that I was playing with was that there were so many different people. And Louisa, uh, in, on several occasions throughout the book, she's like, well, I'm British and you're not, you know, not just to the Australians, but to the Americans. And the, there's some Polish people they're serving as well. And this feeling of I'm part of this, I belong to this country, you can't push me around is I, I didn't make it up. And I think that I think that it's kind of hard for us to understand because we just assume, you know, if you're if you're if you're not being treated fairly, that you shouldn't feel this. Yeah, your home is your home, right? Your home is and your home. there was a there was a term uh, in the states called double victory. Yeah, the idea that if if um, particularly African Americans, if they could serve in World War II and prove their worth, that they would win equality at home right. and safety right. um, in the world. And that's a fight that is definitely still yep. being fought, but we're still willing to do it. Yeah, um, and it it was interesting because um, when you and I first talked about this. I had, I think I had already written the Enigma game at that point. Mm -hmm. I had not come across the term double victory because ah. I hadn't actually done any research about, about um, what went on in the United States. I knew, I knew right. nothing. That's not what I the knew story nothing was. Yeah, about, that's not the story. About, yeah. And, and I thought, oh, right. It's the same thing. It just, I had not come across a name for it, but it was, yeah. it, it was, clearly something that was going on with these people as well. One of the things that happened with um, Caribbean women who decided to join the uh, Women's Auxiliary Air Force or the, or the territorial services was that to get to Britain, they had to travel through the US. And oh, so- <laughs> that's an eye opener. Yeah. yeah so that's... they would, so they would, you know, they would take a boat to Miami and they would take the train from, yeah. from Florida. From the deep South. From the deep south, and they would go through the deep south, and I tell you, these pe these people came from you know kind of like the upper class in yeah. Jamaica and and St. Kitts and St. Lucie or wherever they were coming from, and so they would get on the train and they'd be like, "No, you have to sit over there," and they're like, "Who's sitting mm -hmm. over there?" <laughs> they would have these, and yeah. and and it made people have to like rethink how they were going to deal with these people. Um, one of the one of the women um, who traveled a white woman who traveled from I think it was St. Lucia to the UK found that when she got there she really really didn't relate to any of the English girls and so mm -hmm. she hung out with all the the black Caribbean. women that she yeah. traveled with yeah <laughs> yeah the yeah. whole time she was there all right it's the people you know right and, yeah. and your comfort yeah. level your, your, your well, family yeah, you're, and you, you choose your family. Yeah. I think yeah, that's, yeah. and that the Enigma game, that is very clear. They have all chosen their family, even though they're, yeah. they're from different walks of life. Um, you know, I think I'm going to invite Ellie back because it looks like the Q&A is filling up with some uh -oh. questions. Okay. So Ellie, if you would rejoin us, um, maybe we can answer some questions from the folks at home. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for this really informative and moving discussion. This has been awesome. Uh, I have some audience questions here that I can pull up. Uh, the first one is from Michelle, 
And it's for both of you. What are your favorite books about women pilots or women in history? Well, I will, I, one of the people who actually inspired me to become a pilot is Anne Morrow Lindbergh. Uh, and I have read almost everything she's written. Uh, it, you know, you, she's married to Charles Lindbergh and that's, a, a, you know, a source of, a source of concern, partly for some of the things that she felt she had to support him in uh, during the war and partly because he wasn't always faithful to her. So it was just a very, a very interesting marriage. But How do you stay married a, to a cheating eugenicist? <laughs> How do you do? I don't know, but she did. She yeah. did, you know. <laughs> the power of women. <laughs> but she's a fantastic writer. And uh, she's still, I think, best, she's best known for her inspirational book, Gift from the Sea. But my favorite of her books is called Listen, the Wind. And it's about a flight that she takes. She used to accompany Charles Lindbergh on these sort of, you know, exploration missions that he was supposed to do. So they were, they were surveying potential passenger routes across the Atlantic. And this book is about just this one leg of the flight that they make. Um, they've been kind of going around the world and they had to, and they had to cross the South Atlantic and they got stuck in the Cape Verde Islands uh, because the wind wasn't in the right direction. And it's really just about waiting for the wind and what it's like traveling. But there's this one moment in the middle of this book where th they finally do get going and they have this like 13 hour flight that they do together. And she's his radio operator. She sometimes takes over the flying for him. And they're in this little plane, just the two of them. And in the middle of the South Atlantic and they have been talking in Morse code all night to a German uh, merchant ship, which is somewhere off the coast of South America. And in the morning, they fly over it. And it, it, it's actually the scene that sticks out of that book the most for me. They do a, they do a kind of low pass over the ship and all the sailors are out on the deck waving because they've been talking to them all night. And she is very overwhelmed by this, the need of humans to communicate with each other. You know, there they are in their bubble of, of metal in the air, you know, how many thousand of miles from anywhere. And here are these other people on the water in their bubble, how many thousands of miles they come together for one second. And it's so memorable. So I, sorry, I just kind of went on there about Anne Marl Lindbergh, but, but she, she definitely inspired me as both as a writer and as a pilot. That's amazing. Like, I don't, I don't, it's funny. I don't, I'm not a pilot and, um, and I'm terrified of small planes. <laughs> and so I don't come to it from, from that side. I would say, you know, I don't have a book off the top of my head to recommend, but Bessie Coleman, first African-American female yeah. pilot in the United States is definitely someone to look at. Um, and it's fascinating to sort of read her stories because I've, I've read, you know, several books, bits and pieces here and there. And it's, and it's interesting because if you read children's books, which is where I sort of start with my research, um, it's a heroic story. And then as you get into the more adult stuff, you're like, it's a complicated story, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know? <laughs> and so that's always interesting. Um, to me to watch, but I would look into Bessie Coleman. I would look into Janet Harmon Bragg has a book called yeah, yeah, yeah. Of Setbacks, um, another African-American female pilot. Um, and, uh, um, but for the sheer beauty of flight, um, I, I'm gonna space on the, on the name of the poem. There's a poem that my father um, would recount. Um, Is it and it's high about is, high, is flight, high flight, right? high flight, yeah, high um, flight. John high McGee Gillespie or something. That's John something Gillespie like that. McGee. Yeah. yeah, he had yeah. written it. Uh, he was a pilot serving in the military. And my father traveled a lot for business, and he was on a flight once when the pilot came on and just recited the poem. Oh my from gosh! The heart. And like That's the last amazing. line is reaching out to touch the face of God. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. absolutely beautiful. The, the first, that. the first line, I can't recite it, but the first line is, Oh, I have slipped the surly the bonds, surly of, bonds earth. of earth. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Oh, that gives me shivers still. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and I'll tell you who else, I'll tell you who else, this is like the polar opposite of Charles Lindbergh, is um, Antoine de saint exupery the author of The Little Prince. Oh, the Little Prince. And, yeah, and his, his books on flying are, are really amazing. So, he, I mean, he's got a lot of kind of semi-autobiographical stuff. Uh, Wind, Sand, and Stars. And, and he has one set during the war called Flight to Aris as well. There's also a book called Codename Verity. <laughs> If you're looking for something really, and, and there's also a book called Fly Girl. There's that. There's that. Which we'll I will pat ourselves do. on the back and oh my gosh, <laughs> great things about both of those. All right, Ellie, we'll we'll move on. That's embarrassing. <laughs> The next question is also for both of you. How do you do your research, and what surprised you during the research for these books? I think that I think that we actually both tend to do a lot of reading mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what I start with I, I, I was interested to hear Sherry that you said you start with children's books because I don't think I do start with them although I do go for them as well but I tend to start with I tend to start with like I, I actually have some of the things that I read for the Enigma game here with me so West Indian women at war and um, mother country. And these books are, it's almost, it, you're, it's almost like you're, you've got a primary source, you know, they're, they're, they're hard work to get through, but if you can persevere, um, you sometimes find like real gems of, information about people in them. So um, the, the one for the Enigma game, uh, there was a, a woman named Lillian Bader who was a black woman. I believe she was, she, I don't remember which island she was from in the Caribbean. She was half Caribbean and half English. And she served in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. And she had this bizarre experience where a bunch of kids started taunting her and calling her a Nazi because she was black and they thought she was German and they'd never seen a German or a Nazi um, or a black person. So this kind of incident, I just, um, it's boggling, but it's also, it feels very real. And that's the kind of stuff that I shamelessly steal and stick into my <laughs> books. <laughs> I agree with that. No, that's what you need to do, right? You go spelunking kind of for little right. gems in all of what can be really dense writing sometimes. I mean, I do start with the kids' books quite often because they have good, I can get an overview and they have good um, bibliographies often, and then I'll get into their sources. But um, um, yeah, the, you do I have like good to... bibliographies. That's actually something that I have, I have found is that books that are written for kids. And when I say kids books, I mean like, you know, middle grade and, and, and uh, young adult nonfiction. So sometimes very meaty books, they have fantastic source notes and fantastic I will go to picture bibliographies. Books. I will even read picture, <laughs> they have picture bibliographies books. Googling like nonfiction picture books yeah. tend to have bibliographies and reading Yeah, lists. they do. Yeah. 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 It's incredible. Let someone else do all the heavy lifting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bibliographies, okay? They're like, God they're your bless friend. Him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else have we got here? Uh, the next question is, did you learn about the difficulties added when the Enigma was changed from a three-rotor system to a four-rotor system with completely new code books, not just updates? That's from Marsha. Okay, Yay, Marcia. Well, well, fortunately, fortunately, that didn't happen by the time this book ended. Uh, so yeah, that would have been that, that actually would have just stopped them from being able to do anything. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a non-issue, but it was a conscious non-issue. <laughs> Did you know about that before or after yes. you set your time period? Uh, I, I, it was coincidental that okay. it happened. I mean, the time period was actually dictated by the events of Codename Verity. Right. Um, so, but I, and I did not learn about the change until after I'd written the book. But fortunately, if you, 
Yeah. <laughs> Dodged a bullet there. <laughs> yeah. I, they couldn't have done this with the four rotor dials. It would have been. Like, there would have been an author's note explaining. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it, suspend your disbelief. <laughs> wow. That's so interesting. The next question is from Daisy and it's for both of you. The characters in your novels are so emotionally real. How do you write such realistic emotions for people in tense and traumatic situations? <laughs> Suffer trauma. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's where we unpack our baggage, Daisy. <laughs> I think, I mean, is it for you? It's, for me, it's an act of, of imagination or extrapolation. Yeah. Maybe that's yeah. the right word for uh, it. You know, one of the one of the complaints that I have sometimes seen about Codename Verity is um, that the first part of that book, if you don't know it, is written by one person who is pretending to use the point of view of another. So it's written in the third person, but it's written by one of the characters about another character. And one of the complaints that I get is how could she know what this person is thinking? How could she, how could she write about what happened to this person when it's not her? And I'm like, how do you think you, a novel gets written? You know, she's, she's making it up. Um, and that is actually what you do. And you do, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I guess you don't get it right. You know, mm -hmm. I have not ever been had to land a plane that had has been fired on by enemy aircraft. Um, nor have you. And well, you don't know. I told you I don't like. <laughs> you to just fly. said you were a pilot. <laughs> there might be a reason why. <laughs> well, you know, for but, me, I but, think about it. It's, please. No, I was going to say, um, I was going to say that like for some of the things that, that I wrote about, certainly in Code Name Verity, I based them on other things that had happened to me. It wasn't the same thing, but, you know, I drew on emotions that I recognized. And I think, you know, having a certain amount of empathy is, is what makes you able to create. I think a huge amount of like empathy. That. It's a huge amount of empathy. And the, and the fact that that's why I said extrapolate, because you imagine how you would feel based off of how you have felt in other situations. Yeah. And now yeah. somebody who's actually been fired on by the enemy might have a completely different take, but that's going to be true for yeah. every single person who was fired yeah. on. So as yeah. long as it feels yeah. organic to the character. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like true emotion wrapped in storytelling lies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's, I think that's what, that, what we go for, but you know, mm -hmm. what you're attempting to do as a writer is to, is to, tell that truth through the lies that we tell. <laughs> that makes sense. That's so cool. Oh, writing is amazing. Isn't it? It's like, yeah. it's magic. <laughs> it's magic. Especially when it turns out you get it right. When someone comes to you and says, I've, you know, I've actually been through this and this felt true to yeah. me. Yeah. And, and, and you've had that. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. Sure as, as have I. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's so gratifying. You just think, okay, mm -hmm. well, I don't know how I did it, but I guess- The leap I did of it. faith. That's the yeah. leap of yeah. faith in writing. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of writing, uh, our next question is from Katie. You've both written about flying in World War II before. What brought both of you to this subject? So, well, I think we, we came to, we certainly came to it separately. Um, I, I, you know, I said that I learned to fly because my husband had a pilot's license. But in fact, I was sort of fascinated with flight before that. Um, I don't know if you have heard of a book and television show called Flambards by K.M. Payton, but I read that and watched it like in the 70s when I was in high school. And it was all about, it was all about this guy who wanted to design planes in 1911. And... <laughs> And he eventually goes to war in World War I and is a pilot. And I was just kind of fascinated by, by the flying. And long before I met my husband, who with his little private pilot's license, um, I can remember pulling over the side of a road in the middle of Pennsylvania because there was somebody um, in, a little, in a biplane flying loops over over the intersection there or over a field nearby. And I just like pulled over to watch. So 
it was something that, that I was primed for, you know, <laughs> having, having the opportunity to actually take flights in a small plane and to become part of the company of pilots was something that, that I was like, I was, I was ready for when I was finally able to do it. And it's just, it's just gotten worse since then. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it is definitely different. Like my, my brother was into aviation when he was a kid. My dad got, was working on his private pilot's license, but that wasn't for me. Like I always imagined flight as more of like a, um, a levitation thing. <laughs> like I had lots of dreams of flying, but it was like swimming through the air. Um, but what got me into uh, World War II aviation was actually a Radio Diaries documentary about the Women's Air Force Service pilots that played mm. on my local NPR station. Mm. And there was a line in that um, a, one of the women, she said, like, we were pilots, we were farm girls and heiresses who'd been thrown together. Right. And that just stuck in my head. And I ended up writing um, uh, my first World War II aviation book, Fly Girl, off of that. And then I can say, honestly, that each, I've got two other books. One is a nonfiction about the Tuskegee Airmen came out of having written Fly Girl and also already knowing about something about the Tuskegee Airmen and having met a Tuskegee Airman. And then, um, you know, uh, writing about kamikaze pilots sort of was a na not, not quite a natural next step. No, but it was no part of, it's one of those rabbit holes you fall down yep. doing research and then you're like, oh, why don't I know this? people should know this. And so I'm very curious to see what comes next, but it is uh, uh, an arena that keeps pulling me back in. Yeah. And you, we're stuck in and the me, vortex. Yeah. <laughs> That's so fascinating. I love, like, this is such an awesome discussion. Our next question is from Patty uh, for Elizabeth, and it's, have you been approached to make Codename Verity into a limited TV series? Uh, um, <laughs> I have not. <laughs> um, it, has, it has actually been under option, for, for under film option for here and there, and um, they've come and gone, and nothing has actually happened. Um, so watch this space. That's frustrating. <laughs> un 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 unfortunately, unfortunately, um, not. There are some. There's a, there's a. Uh, there are some kids who have like you know sort of turned it into a play, half an hour long, absolutely fantastic, but uh, nothing official. <laughs> yet, yet, get it together, Hollywood. We're looking at you. Yeah, come on, guys. Is this a school play? It was a school play. They sent me, yeah, they sent me, they sent me a video. It was fantastic, but it was half an hour long. So it was actually, it was actually, <laughs> this is Super very convinced. funny. Okay. Okay. So, you know, um, and if you haven't read it, you don't know, but there's a, a repetition of the phrase, kiss me hearty, which is, are allegedly um, Nelson's last words when he was dying at the battle of Trafalgar. Right. And when they performed this show for their audience, there were uh, of parents and you know educators, whoever it was, there was one woman who didn't really understand what um, was being said, and she thought it was "kiss me, hottie." <laughs> kiss me, you hottie! Like, oh, what right. does that mean? Kiss me, hottie. <laughs> So no, the the short answer is no, they haven't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the answer. Amazing. Our next question is from Lisa, and it's do either of you have a favorite character or book from the work you've written? I find it it, it kind of changes. I, I tend to the best books that I write are the ones where I fall in love with one of the characters, I think. Um uh, the the Verity character from Codename Verity is like the 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 amorphous person that we live with who pays our bills, <laughs> and, and and she 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 definitely kind of has a, a life of her own in this house, um, and so I, I feel like I owe her a lot, and for that reason alone, she is my favorite. Although she's you know kind of hard to beat. But I mean, my other favorite is the, the 
hero of my um, Arthurian African series, which is um, Telemachus, who's kind of, he first makes an appearance at the age of six, but he comes into his own as an 11 year old. They're kind of like borderline middle grade young adult books. And he, he in many ways is a prototype for Verity, but he's also like the darling of my heart. So those are, those are probably my, my number two favorites. Yeah, I think you have to love whoever you're writing at the time, yeah. you know, in order to stick with it. But um, one of my books, The Toymaker's Apprentice, which is a, um, it's a historical fantasy based on the original story of the Nutcracker and the Mouse King. And so Drosselmeyer, who you'd know if you know the ballet or whatever, um, Godfather Drosselmeyer is a character in it. And then his nephew is actually the boy who becomes the Nutcracker. And I, um, I have loved um, Drosselmeyer since I was a little girl. So wow. like that still is like, you know, that, that means a lot to me. But I'd totally have dinner with any of my other characters. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> also, like when you're working with them, you know, when you're, when you're. These when are your you're, coworkers. They're your coworkers. <laughs> they're your friends. They're, you know, you're yeah. fighting with them, whatever. That then they're the most important person in your life. Right, right. That's so cool. Thank you both so much uh, for all of your amazing answers. And thank you to the audience for your awesome questions. And thank you both for joining us today and for sharing your words and insights. Uh, and viewers, don't forget, you can still uh, click the link in the chat box to get, to get your own copy of The Enigma Game and The Blossom of the Firefly and some other books also. Uh, to find out about more events, check out our website for updated listings. You can follow our Children and Teens Department on social media. The handle is posted in the chat. And you can also watch our past events on our Politics and Prose YouTube channel. Thank you again so much. Keep reading widely and expanding your world and stay safe. It's been an honor to host both of you. Thank you so much.